So I want I want to share with you a uh, a uh, a theory that I had uh, or a, an application of a theory that's actually evolutionary based, which will hopefully lead to a segue for whatever time we have remaining to discuss some evolutionary ideas. So one of the reasons that a lot of the folks who we're talking about, the winner take all folks who decide that, hey, I could be a singer and I could be an actor, is that actually they are very poorly calibrated in terms of uh, knowing whether they actually have the talent or not, right? And so I thought when I when I used to watch the opening rounds of American Idol, that's, that's the only time that I would ever yep. watch it. The only reason I would watch it, uh, the later the, the later rounds, I was completely uninterested. I found it grotesque and and just really uh, obnoxious. But what I love, uh, you know, as a psychologist in the early stages, is the true genuine surprise that people had when they would get up, and you know their voices could kill you know all rhinos around the world. It's so bad, and yet they were genuinely surprised when the judges said, "Gee, you really really suck," right? And they were genuinely honestly surprised. And so I thought at one point, well, what could explain this miscalibration? And so this is where I brought out of my evolutionary toolbox the ideas of Robert Trivers, one of the most famous uh-huh. evolutionary biologists, where he talks about the evolution of self-deception. And so let me mention it to our viewers who may not be familiar with it. So Robert Trivers argued that, look, why is it that people have this uncanny ability to self-deceive? And he argued that it's an adaptive mechanism whereby when you and I are engaging in an interaction, ultimately, one of my intents might be to manipulate you in a Machiavellian sense. But this might send off little micro cues that I am trying to do that, which you're trying to pick up in me. Now, the way that I can ensure that you don't pick it up in me is if it shuts off in me. And the only way for me to do that is to believe the lie that I'm about to tell you. So it's really an evolutionary arms race in dyadic interactions, which ultimately leads to the evolution of self-deception. What do you think of that? Oh, well, I, I, I actually wrote a whole unpublished book on self-deception <laughs> because I've been so interested in it, you know, oh, cool. and I hope at some point to do something about it. But um, so, so let me make a couple of comments about sure. that. One of the let's look at extroversion, for example. So if you're extroverted and emotionally stable, you're assertive and enthusiastic and gregarious and and and, you know, people will tend to towards considering you a leader because you'll take charge of a social situation. And then if you're low in neuroticism, you have very little fear. And so you appear dominant. There's other ways of being dominant, but that's one way. And one of the ways that people determine whether or not you know what you're doing is to see whether or not you're afraid when you make a claim. And if you're not afraid, then they assume that you're willing to act out the claim and that that's pretty good evidence that it's a decent claim. Now, it is by no means invariably true evidence. But it's like it's like dominance in a it's like a dominance dispute in a primate pack the, or in a lobster uh, 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 dispute, for that matter. The guy whose nerve breaks first loses. And so he's seen as less true. OK, so with the narcissism that you're seeing in the in those uh, Re- remarkable displays of of talentless blindness, let's say. That seems to be a combination of extremely high extroversion and extremely low agreeableness. So very low empathy. And then I would also say, you to really get a narcissist going, you also have to shelter them from any negative criticism for, for a good part of their life. Now, some people are just opaque to that, but but if you spoil them, let's say, using a non-technical term as children and constantly praise them for everything they do and never call them to task and they're extroverted and disagreeable, then you'll get a nice narcissist out of the deal. And I do agree, you rarely see better displays of narcissism than on those uh, initial um, uh, auditions. I have the opposite reaction to you, though, is I find those so painful I can hardly watch them, whereas I actually kind (laughs) of like the triumphant ones later, you know. So, So anyways... But, but this is more complicated, I think, than Trivers realized. And here's why. And I think this has to do with the winner-take-all phenomena. So let's say that you're extroverted and enthusiastic and, and low in negative emotion, and you have an idea. And the fact that you're 
that you have those characteristics aggregates a group around you. And let's add to that the possibility that you're also intelligent, so you're attracting intelligent people. And then what you get is a, you start to get a loop of communicative feedback between a group of people who are actually capable of undertaking a fairly complex task. Now the task itself is going to shift across time because what the hell do you know to begin with? But that, that confidence might catalyze the formulation of a group that has enough ability and competence and flexibility to pursue success successfully across time, thereby validating your initial co confidence, even though your confidence was not targeted towards the actual outcome. And you see this in entre entrepreneurial ventures because one of the buzzwords that surrounds entrepreneurial success is the capacity to pivot, which means, well, you come out with an idea to begin with, and then you find out that, well, it's just not marketable, and you don't just give up and go home, you take your team and you aim at something else. So there's this peculiar set of circumstances that, that optimism can produce that's valid, even though objectively speaking, the initial optimism was unwarranted. Now, that doesn't mean that the same sort of thing can't cycle into absolute hell, because that's, I would say, an equally equa probable outcome or even a more improbable outcome. But you wouldn't have to be spectacularly successful that often from an evolutionary perspective, especially if you were male and could leave a tremendous number of descendants. Th there you go that. using transphobic systemic words like male. I'm offended. Yeah, I know, I know. And, and, well, I, I just read one of those bloody um, abstracts that the uh, new peer review, new real peer review love, people... Love those guys. Out. Oh, me too, man. I'm I, addicted I, to I, those guys. Yeah, I, I, I think they're doing a great service, you know. I just read one that, that suggested that the entire category of man, men should be done away with.